Um, I'm going to ask some odd questions in this class. My first philosophy teacher, when I was a fresh-faced undergraduate, gave, uh, gave me a, a neat little aphorism, which is not entirely true, but has a kernel of truth, like most good aphorisms. He said, uh, philosophy is not about answering questions, it's about questioning answers. And that's not entirely true. Most philosophers think they're answering some questions, and the great philosophers think they've answered a great number of questions. However, the important part is questioning answers. And one of the skills that philosophy, and logic is perhaps the core of philosophy, teaches is the right questions to ask to notice when there are assumptions that someone has and to pinpoint those, um, those assumptions and ask them about them. All right, this is not a strange question, it's just a simple question. What's a proper name? It's not a rhetorical question, I am actually asking it. What is a proper name? Yes? Something that you call something. Something that you call something. Couldn't, that could be true of most words, couldn't it? Well. All right, let, let me say, uh, let's say I call this chair Joe. This is Joe. Meet Joe. A name given to a specific object. Okay, so yes. The difference between it, Joe and chair is that Joe refers to just this one. It's specific. So a proper name is specific individual. Okay? All right. Now we're going to be talking about concepts in this class. And concepts, well, the word chair is an example of a word that stands for a concept. Actually, it stands for more than one concept. That, that's one of the things that we'll, we'll stress, is that most words are associated with more than one concept. And we're actually interested in the concepts rather than the words. Um, Uh, 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 yeah. So. so the difference between chair and Joe is Joe is a proper name and it just picks out uh, an individual entity. Now, if all we had, if all that our words were, were proper names, then communication would be very limited. Because the only way that you could know what I meant is if we were both in the same room with the thing that I gave a name for. The only way that you know what uh, a proper name refers to is if you've been exposed to that thing, like, uh, or if you've met that person. Whereas concepts <coughs> are not like that. I can talk about things um, that you've never encountered. And I, you can t I can talk about things that don't exist. I can invent things and explain them to you using concepts. So concepts are a huge step forward from um, proper names. What's interesting is that babies, when we teach them language, seem to know the difference. I mean, it would be kind of hard to teach babies language if they assumed that everything was a proper name. You know, so chair, and then when we, if you're in another room, you say, go sit in the chair and the baby has to come all the way back to this room and sit in this particular chair because that's what chair is, it's that one thing. They seem to be able to grasp the general, the generality of concepts, that they, can, they cluster together things of the same type. So, concepts are about a very uh, important part of what makes uh, thought and language possible this sort of generality feature of them. Uh, now, what is a concept? Well, it's not quite the same as a word. So, for example, dog. If I'm speaking imprecisely, I could say dog is a concept. But, of course, really, dog is a word. It is a word I'm using to express a concept because that's the only way I can do it. The only way I can convey a concept to you is by using words. But it is important to remember that words and concepts are not the same thing. To illustrate this, who knows a language other than English? 
Okay. Can you tell me the word for dog? What, what language are we talking? Arabic. Okay, uh, I'm going to have to spell it phonetically then because I don't know Arabic script. But what word, what's the word for dog? Kel. Say that again? Kel. So it sounded to me a little bit like that. Okay, which of course is a kind of seaweed, but um, uh, that, that'll do for now. Any other languages? Yes? French. Chien. Chien. A little German, uh, Hund. Hund, that's right. In Spanish, would it be Perro? Anyone got any more? In Japan, they call them Inu. Inu, okay. Again, I'm just going to write it phonetically. Well, you nailed it. Uh, good. Well, actually, I know that because somebody said it in the last class, but, uh, but we'll pretend I kind of nailed it just because I'm clever. <laughs> all right. Now, all of those are different words, right? You can tell they're different. They have different letters. If I'd written them rightly, <coughs> these two would be in different scripts. They wouldn't even be in, uh, you know, using the alphabet that English uses. Um, what do they have in common? They all describe a member of the genus Canis. That's uh, that's a specific way of putting it. Yes. They're all the same concept. They all yes. They are they. What we would say is they're not. They're they are not the concept itself because these are words, but they're all related to the same concept. So one way of putting it, and the way we'll put it in this class, is they all express the same concept. And I'm going to draw a concept like this. That is my pictorial representation of a concept. Looks a little bit like a, uh, a thought bubble. And it's not, a, you, some people might argue that concepts are just ideas in our heads, but they're not, they're not. Most people say that that's not the case now. Most people now say that that's not the case. <coughs> because we can have ideas of things. And if we have ideas of concepts, then the ideas are not the concepts. So. The reason why, if you were asked to translate the German word Hund into English, you would replace it with dog, is not that you picked an English word at random, it's because these two uh, different words in different languages have something in common. What they share is that they both express the same concept. At least that's what we think. Now, this is quite, it's quite useful to learn a language other than uh, the one that is native to you. Because what you discover is uh, you can discover subtle gradations of meaning just from the different words they, they use. And I'll give an illustration in a second. But So concepts are not the same as words because you can have one concept that is shared by many different words. So the concept is, dog is not the same as the concept because dog is not the same as hunt. But hunt and dog are both related to the same concept. <coughs> Conversely, you can have a single word, and I'm, I'm going to pick light just because it's an easy example, that has many concepts associated with it. So, so there we have one concept, many words. Here we're going to have one word, many concepts. What does light mean? What is this word? A simple monosyllabic English word. What does it mean? Not heavy. Not heavy. So that would be an adjective, not heavy. Is that it? Be like the sun. So, uh, so another adjective is um, not dark. Yes. The verb to light something on fire. Verb. It's strange that that should occur to you. Paramanian. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, to set fire to, to set fire to, that's a little, you know, when you light a candle, I'm setting fire to this candle, but you know what I mean, yes. To illuminate. To illuminate, another verb, so like you light a movie set, or that lamp lights the room. It's a noun, it's a particle. Oh, well... A particle or a wave, depending on, yeah, so, so noun, the stuff that comes from 
lights that makes it light. Yes, so now the stuff, I'm just going to leave it at that. The stuff, <laughs> you know what it is. Maybe it's got photons or whatever. Anything else? Yes? The devices or objects that make the stuff. That's or true, that. right. Uh, noun, uh, e.g. lamps. Now all of these are pretty terrible definitions, but they're just to illustrate that these are all different. They are different concepts that are associated with the same word. And if you look up any word in a dictionary, you will usually see that there's several different concepts associated with it. Now, this illustrates uh, a couple of things. <coughs> One thing, um, when you are doing philosophy, this is the only philosophy class where you don't have to write papers. And every other philosophy paper class, you have to write papers. Uh, and if you're writing papers, they can be on very interesting things. They can be on very important things. They can be on matters of life and death. There's a whole class on matters of life and death that I just taught called Mortal Questions. Um, but it's always important, and this is something not just philosophers, but certainly we, we stress it, you've got to define your terms. You've got to define what it is that you are talking about. And this is very important because it's not enough just to use the words, because the words have many different concepts associated with them. You have to say exactly which concept of the many that the word stands for that you are focusing on. Now, this seems less important when we're talking about the word light, but let me give you an example of a case where uh, using one word with several different concepts, can disguise a faulty argument. This is called equivocation, where you use the same word, but you use it in different senses in different parts of the argument. So, uh, and this is an argument about ab abortion, which is an important social issue. And it's an argument that purports to show that abortion is murder. Now, you might believe this. This might even be true. But this argument is not the right way to show it. It goes like this. One, and this is an example of a premise. We will talk more about premises uh, next class. But first premise, first assumption. Uh, killing innocent human beings is murder. Who would agree with that? Let's you know, let's ignore self-defense, because self-defense, usually they're not innocent. But I suppose they could be falling on you or something. But, um, but yes, I think most people would say, yeah, sounds fair enough. Even people who are pro-choice um, would certainly agree with that. Okay, <laughs> two, fetuses are innocent humans. And here's my evidence. They're innocent because they're in the womb. They've got no chance to, unless they're, you know, twins and they've, one of them's throttled the other one, it's unlikely they have the chance to commit a crime. Um, and two, they're humans. They're the product of humans. They're not goldfish. We can do a DNA analysis. They're obviously human. So they're innocent humans. Conclusion, put those two together, and this is an example of an argument. What does it appear to show? So one, killing innocent humans is murder. Two, fetuses are innocent humans. Conclusion? But killing fetuses, fetuses is, murder. is murder. And what is a term for killing fetuses? Abortion. Abortion. So this, this purports to show that abortion is murder. Now, you might wonder if it's that easy, why is there any disagreement about it? <laughs> the answer is that this is a classic example of using a word in two different senses. What is the offending word in this case? Innocence. Not in this case. Murder. Although innocent could be an example. Yeah. Murder. Not murder in this case. Human being. Person. What's that? Human being. Just human. Yes, human is the word. What are the two different ways in which it is used in that argument? Yes. The first premise describes a human as an adult independent organism. Well, the first one, the first premise says killing innocent humans is murder. What do we mean by human? We mean human being in that, in that statement. Whereas the second one uses human how? Conceptual. As, as a uh, group of organisms. Well, as, as a biological a category. As a yes. species category. Now, 
you can use a species category in many ways. So for example, imagine you're an archaeologist and you're digging up stuff and you come across a bone and you ask, is this human? It's a legitimate question. How would you settle that? You send it off to the lab, they do DNA analysis, and they say, yes, it is human. Does that mean if you set fire to it, you're committing murder? Yeah. Clearly not. So human as a biological category is much broader than human being. You can have all sorts of human things. If you bite, who bites the flesh around their nails? You are, you are killing human things. You are killing human cells. But they don't cut you off to prison because you're allowed to. It's, uh, human cells, killing human cells is not murder. Alright, so what is it murder to kill? Well, human beings. Now, what is human being? It's not the same as just being human. Not everything human is a human being. A human bone is not a human being. Okay? So to treat them as if they meant the same thing is cheating. Avoiding uh, having the important discretion, which is, what is it to be a human being? Is it simply to have human DNA? No, because then when you have cancer treatment, you're committing murder because you're killing human cancer cells. Um, it is something more than that. Well, what is it? That's where you get into the debate. Is it uh, having the ability to feel pain? Is it uh, having the ability to think? That's the important discussion, and you have those discussions in other philosophy classes. But it's an illustration of how using one word can be misleading, because there are two different concepts associated with the word. Human in the sense of human being, and human in the sense of the biological category. Uh, now, I was said I'd give you an example of how if you learn another language, sometimes it will, it will teach you to make finer distinctions than you're used to. The example that I'm familiar with, because we learned this in school, was French. And in French, they have two different verbs for to know. The, verb, the English verb to know is not uh, replaced by a single French verb. There are two different ones. There's one which is savoir, and there's another which okay. is connaître. That's right. What's the difference? One is to know of some. The best way I can think to explain it is when it comes to a particular person. You know of that person. You know that they exist in the world. Well, uh, actually, let's put it this way. Savoir would be something like knowing facts. So uh, you would know that 2 plus 2 equals 4. And it would be je sais. I know that. Whereas connect is to, in the sense of do you know Joe? Yes, I know Joe. You don't know everything about Joe, but you know him. You are acquainted exists. with Joe. You have, you have met Joe. So connect tends to be with the, the personal kind of knowing. And when, you, when it's explained to you that way, clearly they're different things, right? But we might forget that simply because of the accident. It's a totally random thing that in English we happen to use one word to use both. And, it, and that can cause us not to distinguish clearly between the different concepts. But they're obviously different concepts when it's pointed out to you. Sometimes this is <coughs> immediately obvious. For example, what is a pen? You do know what a pen is, come on. <laughs> this is a pen, but what else is a pen? A container for pigs. Yes, a, a, an animal enclosure, like a pig pen. How the hell did those two t totally distinct concepts get lumped together under one word? It's just an accident. When they're that different, nobody confuses them. But they can be fairly close, in which case it is easy to get them confused, which is why it's very important to define your terms. Say, when I'm talking about knowing, I'm talking specifically about this kind of knowing. Um, that is why it's important to define your terms, so that you can be sure that nobody will be confused. And th th there's another thing we can learn from this. If you ever learnt this at some point in your previous schooling, that it is good strategy in a paper to say, Webster's Collegiate Dictionary defines blank as, or the Oxford English Dictionary defines blank as, forget that now. Do not ever do that. And the reason why you should never do that is because dictionaries do not define concepts. Dictionaries, and that's not their job. I'm not blaming them, that's not their job. Their job is to list 
associated concept. So if you look up any word in the dictionary, there's, a, there's like 10 things. It's not only current usage. If you look in a really good dictionary, it's got archaic uses. So for example, you find out that nice didn't used to mean the way what we mean. It means precise. So a nice distinction means a precise distinction. That, you find that in a dictionary. And it's totally useless, or at least to, to most purposes, because you don't need, you, when you're talking about something, you're only talking about one specific concept. Well, why not just list that one concept? Well, even then, a dictionary's job is not to be very precise. A dictionary's job is to try and capture all the ways that people do use it for. And this is where... Who listens? Does anyone here listen to NPR? You should all listen to NPR. NPR is awesome. Um, they have... Uh, University of Michigan has a channel 91.1. University of Michigan State has one that's 90.5. That's mostly classical music. But NPR has great shows. But one show, one thing that they have, I think, on Saturdays that really pisses me off <laughs> um, is they, they invite on a linguist. And it's called That's What They Say. And this is, she's a linguist at the uh, University uh, at Harvard, our sister campus. Um, and they're always asking her things like, well, people use it this way, should they use it this way? And she always says, well, if people do it, then it's okay. Wrong! You've got to stand up to this. For example, this literally makes me explode. What's wrong with what I just said? You're not actually exploding. I'm not, if, if I literally exploded, you would be scraping me off the walls. And I, you're not, so. But enough people do that, probably inspired by the character played by Rob Lowe on Parks and Recreations, um, that they have now started in some dictionaries saying one meaning of the word literally is figuratively. The opposite of what it means, right? <laughs> Why do they say that? Because enough people are stupid enough to say that, and they figure, well, words mean what people use them for. No, words mean what people should mean by them, not what they actually do. Everybody can be wrong except me. Um, so that's one disagreement. And, but dictionaries tend to cave pretty quickly, because their job is to list how people use them. Whereas, and what that means is that important distinctions tend to get lost. Whereas philosophy is all about making important distinctions because the more distinctions you can make, the clearer you can be. Let me give you an example. What's the difference between these two words? Jealous and envious. Who be honest now, who thought they meant exactly the same thing? Only one honest person. Well, Alright, what's... They have to be, like, similar. Well, what's the difference between them? Isn't jealous just being, like, jealous of them, like, why can't I have that? And isn't envious, like, I want that, but I can't have it? Like they sounded pretty similar the way right. you said it. Well, jealous is jealous, and envious is like, I want it. Yes, that's true. Jealous is jealous, and envious is envious, but yeah. I feel like envious is more of a, like an, an anger toward the person because of what they have, whereas jealous no. is just wanting what they have. See, here's the distinction. I, actually, I, uh, I'm not going to give a very clear distinction, but jealousy is to do with human relationships. So, for example, if you see your ex with somebody new and you've still got feelings for that person, you are jealous of their new partner. Envy is objects. I am envious of you because you have an iPhone 7 or whatever we're up to now. Right? I'm not an Apple person, so I'm not actually envious. But. So, there's a clear distinction, right? They mean different things. But pretty soon, because enough people use them unclearly, we'll use the, lose that distinction and it, and it will be conveyed in a dictionary. Here's another one that drives me crazy. I, I am easily driven crazy, if you get the impression. Um, what is the difference between few, fewer, and less? One is with continuous types of objects and one is with uh, discrete, right? Absolutely right. Which is which? 
uh, fewer is with discrete and less is continuous. Right. Discrete means individual things. So, for example, you have fewer sugar lumps, less sugar. You have fewer drops of water, less water. Where do they always get this wrong? The supermarket. The supermarket. It should be 10 items or fewer. <laughs> fewer. Yes. See, a little knowledge doesn't actually help you. It just makes you angry at the world, <laughs> right? You walk through the supermarket line oblivious and perfectly happy to the people like me who are fuming with rage at something trivial. Okay, but these, are, these distinctions, it's important that there be distinctions because then you can be clear. You can make clear distinctions. And uh, dictionaries don't necessarily reflect that. But that's not their job. But given that it's not their job, don't turn to them to do something that isn't really their job. So, next time you're writing a paper and you find yourself about to type Webster's, stop it. Don't type. Webster was a Johnny come lately anyway. He had dictionaries on the floor. All right. Uh, let's talk about what we're actually supposed to be talking about. So we're talking about concepts. Concepts are not the same as words, uh, but we have to use words to convey them. So we tend to think that a concept is the meaning of a general word. It's not the word itself, it's the meaning. Okay, but, but the important thing about concepts that distinguishes them from proper names is that they are ways of grouping things. And let me introduce the terminology that we use in this class. And it's slightly different from the way it's used in, say, biology. So, if I were to talk about Joe, well, actually, who has a cat? What is your cat's name? Moose. Moose. That is a silly name, but never mind. Okay, so Moose, this is Moose. Moose is a reference because it's a specific individual cat. There is only one Moose. Um, now, what kind of thing is Moose? Moose is a cat. So we're going to say cat in this case is species. Now, we're not using it in the biological sense because, for example, Joe, Joe's species is chair. All right? Species is used more broadly in this class. It's not used in the strictly biological sense. It's uh, sort of the next level up of generality or abstractness. So Joe is a concrete individual, discrete, you might say, uh, but Joe is a type of thing. What is the thing of which uh, uh, I'm sorry, a Joe is a token of a particular type. What is the type of which Joe is a token or instance? Chair. So chair would be Joe's species. What is the thing of which Moosh is a particular instance? It's cat. Okay, so Moosh goes in the cat species. These are my props. I only have props for this one class, so don't, so don't get like, I'm not going to bring them to every class. All right, who has a dog? Dog people. You can't be a dog and a cat person. That's cats. unnatural. I like what's, what's your dog's name? Abigail. Abigail. All right, so here's Abigail, and Abigail is a dog, so the species dog. Okay, so we have two different reference or indivi concrete individuals, Moosh and Abigail, and two different, in this case, species, dog and cat. Now, what do dog and cat have in common? They're animals. Or if you wanted to be a little bit more specific, did, what did you say? Pets. Pets. Now, pets, they are both animals and they are pets. What's the difference between... So I could categorize them as both types of pet or both types of animal. <coughs> Bless you. Which should, I, um, which should I categorize them as? When you use pets, because animal would be a more general, even more generalistic term than pet. Because are there cats that are not pets? Yes. Sorry. Yes. yes. So, I mean... Uh, Pets, we might say, is a slightly different way of looking at the world from animal. Pets is what you might call an anthropocentric put of way of looking at it. Because what makes something a pet? Whether or not humans keep them. Um, so you can have cats that are pets and cats that are not. We, what we might say is what is more essential to their nature? Their relationship with humans or their animal nature? I think most of us would say they're animal nature, because that's independent of whether or not there are humans around. But still, uh, how we categorize things is kind of relative. So for example, we could think of a particular kind of activity, like drinking alcohol. 
And some person could say, what is drinking alcohol an example of? Hobbies. Or somebody else could say it's an example of sins. Right? It depends on which way you're looking at, at it. But we try to be, um, we try to come up with categories that are as neutral as possible. This isn't always possible. But let's just say, well, what's a little bit more specific than animal that isn't human-centric? A mammal. There you go. So let's say uh, cat and dog are both species that go together in the more broader ge so genus. Uh, groups together species. Okay, now, again, genus is not being used in exactly the way it's used in biology, because the way we're going to use it is we're only going to use ge genus and species. So, uh, let's say mammal is a genus when it's relative to cat and dog, but when it's relative to animal, it's a species. Do you like how I did that? So it's a species when it's relative to a more abstract or more general category, but it's a, gen it's a genus when it is the more abstract or general category relative to more specific ones. Okay? Does that make sense? Um, you cracked your knuckles? I'm sorry, you'll have to leave. <laughs> no, I'll let you off this time. But learn your lesson. I should bring a little, uh, a little mini guillotine for people's fingers. <laughs> like in the old Pink Panther movies. All right, um, let's see. Uh, so what we have there is we have gradations of abstractness and concreteness. The reference to the most concrete, the, the genus is the most abstract. We're becoming more abstract. Uh, and moving this way, we become more concrete. Look at practice quiz. Uh, let's see, 2.1 on page 16. This is where those of you who actually got the textbook are rewarded for your virtue. But I'm going to help out the other one. All right. Um, Let's start over here. Could you do number one, please? For each of the following pairs of concepts, so each of these is a concept. First determine which is the genus, which the species, then name two other species of the same genus. So, man and animal. Man would be the uh, species and animal of the genus. Okay, and what would be two other species of the same genus? So the genus is animal, what are two other species? I've given you them. Dog and there you go. All right, number two. The species would be coat and the garment is the genus. Uh, two other examples would be this here boot and a shirt. There you go. Number three. The species would be car and the genus would be uh, two other examples. Okay, and? And boat. There you go. Number four. Oh, the species is baseball and the genus is sports. And actually, it's obviously being miscategorized. Um, what was it? Who's the, uh, I think it was John Crook, who was a rather fat um, batsman, who famously, he famously had testicular cancer and lost the testicle to cancer. And, he once said, uh, uh, when he was mad at the umpire, I'm going to take my ball and go home. <laughs> He's a funny guy. But uh, somebody once said to him, this woman said to him, uh, uh, how can you be uh, an athlete and be so fat? And he said, I'm not an athlete, I play baseball. <laughs> anyway, yes. Two other species is red ball and frisbee golf. Frisbee golf. Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah, obviously you play well. frisbee golf because <laughs> nobody else. Okay. No. Okay. I've actually seen. Uh, these weird, I was out walking in, in a, a park, and there was like these weird metal things with like chains, yeah. and it's I golf. had to come, that was a frisbee golf. Yeah, the baskets. Yeah, yeah. Give it a try, man. I, uh, I will, I will. Number five. Um, Non-fiction book is the species, uh, or autobiography, autobiography is the species, non-fiction book is the genus. Uh, 
documentary book and uh, documentary. No, that would be a movie. <laughs> Uh, Dictionary. Yeah. Okay. Actually, autobiographies are not always non-fiction. I mean, when Charles Barkley said he was misquoted in his autobiography. Um, okay. One more set of terms I see I rambled on. One more set of terms that I want to give you before we're done for today. And that is uh, these two. Try that one on the board. Uh, mutually exclusive and jointly exhausted. If you're defining species within a genus, you want to make sure that once you finish getting your categories, your, spe your species is, that all of the species are both mutually exclusive and jointly exhausted. To illustrate this, imagine you had the sad job of managing a video store. It's sad because you're going to be un unemployed very soon. Uh, I believe there still are video stores. Who's been in a video store recently? Family video? They're about the only one left. Yeah. Um, all right, so you're, you're in charge of, uh, of a family video. And you say, okay, we're going to reorganize it. And we've got to come up with categories. First of all, why have you got to come up with categories? So people can find what they want, right? And you say, okay, I've come up with the categories. Here they are. Western comedy. Done. Why is that stupid? Well, both of those points are true. First of all, a Western could be a comedy. What that means is they are not mutually exclusive. Because if the categories are mutually exclusive, if you're in one, you're automatically not in any of the others. So if categories are mutually exclusive, they're like gangs. You know, if you're in the Bloods, you're not in the Crips, right? It just, there's no overlap. No overlap would be the best way of putting it. So mutually exclusive means there's no overlap. And clearly, what movie proves that comedy and western are not mutually exclusive? Blazing Saddles. Blazing Saddles, one of the great movies of all time. That movie is remarkable for, for, for many reasons, but one of them is it was the first instance of flatulence in a movie. Before Blazing Saddles, nobody had ever farted in a movie. I think that's something Mel Brooks would throw. All right. Jointly exhaustive. That was your point. What would you say it again? You're bound to have more than just those two types of movies. Yes. Name a movie that proves that Western and comedy are not jointly exhaustive. Because if they were Casablanca. jointly exhaustive, then they'd cover everything. Casablanca. Casablanca. That's right. It's not a Western. It's not a comedy. There you go. So you want your categories to be mo both mutually exclusive if you that is, they don't overlap, and jointly exhaustive, that is, when you put them all together, they cover everything. Family Video um, came up with a system for this, alphabetic. Why is that stupid? You have to know the movie you want to watch. Yeah, I mean, who comes into a movie and says, I'm in the movie for a K movie tonight. <laughs> yeah, I'm feeling K-ish. Um, that's the trouble. You want the categories to be types of movies because people want to watch, I want to watch a comedy, or I want to watch a horror movie, or I want to watch Evil Dead 2, which is both, and also one of the great movies of all time. Um, all right, so remember those terms. You actually may have come across those before, but they're very important. 